My name is Monk Rowe and we're in West Orange, New Jersey for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Slide Hampton with me today. And um, you know, an interviewer is not supposed to tell stories, but I must tell you that a couple years ago I heard your band at the Iridium. Oh yes. Yeah. And I happened to get a seat that was right at the end of the saxophone section. Mm -hmm. And I was able actually to see the music and I saw this passage coming up. I said, this is totally impossible. They cannot play this. And not only did they play it, but the whole band in unison played this lick that I was just astounded at. Night in Tunisia. Yes. I could not believe they pulled it off. And you write some challenging music. When we first played that, and Paquito de Rivera heard it, he said, God, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> it was a unison lick, right? Yeah, yeah, I actually it made it up. It was actually a sort of a copy from the Charlie Parker break mm -hmm. that he had made. Yeah. That was great. I just I just had to tell you that that it certainly made an impression. <laughs> well we we just played that arrangement, not that arrangement, one another arrangement of Night in Tunisia when I was in Holland a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And we, I got ready to give them that break too, but I didn't have the courage to give it to them. Really? <laughs> so you do have <clears throat> some sympathy. For, for where you're at and oh, yeah. who's playing your music. You have to adjust, okay. you know, because if you find a real enthusiastic bunch of guys, then you, you give them any difficult music. Yeah. And they're glad to mm -hmm. have the challenge. Other guys, oh man, this is difficult, you know, so. Yeah. Wow. Well, you have done uh, both small group and big band music. Is there a place that you're most comfortable in? You know, you're thinking, of course, I've been asked that question many times, and mm -hmm. most musicians are. But see, the thing is that we actually were, were raised in the big band period. Mm -hmm. And all the musicians that you hear playing the small groups that we aspire to, like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and Benny Goodman, uh, Stan Getz, they all were raised in the big band period. You know, And that was what prepared them so well to be so well presented in small groups that big band experience. So actually we find both of them as, as, uh, as uh, important, but of course you can enjoy yourself on um, one way in a small group because you get to improvise more. Mm -hmm. and in the big band you have the wonderful experience of playing in the ensemble with other people, which is very important and wonderful also. It might seem obvious to musicians what that positive experience of being in a big band is, but maybe non-musicians who might s see this tape. Can you relate what kind of things you gain from that? Well, you know, what people think when they see a person in a big group, they think that it, you know, is a kind of a situation that's so well organized that it would kind of prevent you from being free enough to improvise. Mm -hmm. It's not the case at all. Actually, because improvisation is certainly a free style of playing music, but there is a lot of organization that goes on in an improvisation. To have a good improvisation, there's a composition that goes on, a certain amount of theory, a certain amount of all the things that you actually learn also in the, in the large ensembles. Mm -hmm. Hearing your, your note in place with everything else, I mean, really helps your ear, doesn't it? It does, and you hear the resolutions of the harmony, the harmony of arrangements that are written by great arrangers. You know, I remember when I played with the Dizzy Gillespie, and I was playing arrangements by uh, Quincy Jones, by Dizzy himself, Ernie Wilkins, Melba Liston, Benny Golson. You learn about resolutions in the big groups because you hear these all these resolving harmonies and things. Mm -hmm. So when you improvise, you also use resolutions as a big part of the way that you make an improvisation. That's a great point. When you were growing up, um, did you have a musical family? My mother and father, all my sisters and brothers were musicians. Mm. I was raised in Indianapolis, which was a wonderful musical environment. As Freddie Hubbard was there, Wes Montgomery, J.J. Johnson, and just a lot of guys that were really very, very talented musicians that never became known. But we had a wonderful environment, and the people there were very supportive of young people becoming musicians. In the high schools, marching band, they were very encouraging to us. 
So we were raised in an environment of music, and our family band, we traveled throughout the country playing places. Mm -hmm. Kind of, what were the venues? Were they dances or just parties and that kind of thing? At one time, all the, the venues that, that big bands actually, most of them were usually places that people were dancing. Mm -hmm. That was a big ins ins part of the inspiration for the music in general. Write something that will make the people dance. Yeah. Because it's a little backwards in the way it was in classical music. When you hear classical music, you hear music that is actually coming from a dance. First there was a dance, and then there was the music. Like the gavotte yeah. and those things. Yes. Yeah, that's See? a good, great point. And in jazz, first there was the music, and then there was the dance. Uh -huh. You see, so it was very, that was a very inspiring part of it, but we also finally played at Carnegie Hall, mm -hmm. Powell Theater, and again the, the uh, Savoy Ballroom where everybody's dancing, again like a thousand people dancing, yeah. the floor's going up and down like this, you know. And we actually, we played the Apollo, and then we went into Savoy for two weeks, and we came by popular demand back in the Apollo again, and nobody ever did that, you know. Wow. And the thing was that, see, in the Apollo you have these big shows. You got a lot of music. We didn't read music. We had a couple of brothers that read, but the rest of us didn't read. They had to teach us the parts. I see. So we would learn the parts by memory, and we played the show, and the people, did, they loved it. Mm -hmm. That's really neat. What year would this have been? That was in the, uh, in the early, in, well, I guess in the, like in the, in the early 50s. Uh-huh. And they could be, uh, the Apollo, could be, let's, let's say, unkind to people they didn't like. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, they were kind of, they were kind of uh, uh, outspoken. If they didn't, if they didn't like something, they would say so. Uh -huh. And actually, it was a good, it was a good uh, point because it really did uh, make people when they when they went there, they made them do the very best. Mm -hmm. And some big stars actually from those uh, talent shows came out of those talent shows because the competition was always so high. But they would, if, they, if they liked you, they would let you know, and if mm -hmm. they didn't like you, they would let you know. I see. <laughs> when did you first uh, get the urge to become an arranger? Well, you know, somebody would just ask me that question, and in the case of us, which are all the guys in Indianapolis, that David Baker was there, and of course, J.J. Johnson, we all started to learn to arrange right, right with learning to play the instrument. Mm. Because we thought in order to be a, a complete musician, you had to learn about theory, you had to learn about orchestration, you had to learn about arrangements, you had to learn about playing in the ensemble. So this was all a part of becoming a musician for us. And so the arranging and everything came right along with learning to play the instruments. I see, so, so it wasn't really just like this separate decision. I can play now and then I, I need to be a writer too. Mm. Kind of just hand in hand. In the case of many guys, it was like that. But in our case, mm. they fooled us right from the beginning and said, you guys got to learn all of this right away. And we thought it was true, and we tried it. And who was telling you this, your teachers? The teachers, okay. oh yeah. They were teaching you theory and everything right from the beginning. And actually, in general, in the uh, environment, you know, we just had this great uh, inspiration to try to learn how to arrange and to orchestrate. It was an inspiration. A lot of it was, uh, was a decision that we made ourselves. We just wanted to know these things, you know. Sure, sure. Who were the influences um, on the trombone for you back then? There were many. At that time, there were many trombone players that were very popular. As later in the 50s and 60s, you started not to hear much of trombone players anymore. But in the 40s and 50s, there were a lot of trombone players that were popular. It's Tommy Dorsey. Yeah. There was Trummy Young, there finally was J.J. Johnson, there was Jack T. Garden, there was Lawrence Brown, a thousand guys, you mm -hmm. know. So we were listening to all of them, and actually we wasn't really thinking about having a favorite. We were just loving all of it and learning, mm -hmm. enjoying listening and learning from all of them. Neat. You were, uh, let's see, you were born in 32? Yes. And... Do you recall anything different about your family life during the World War II years? Well, all my brothers were in the Army. Uh -huh. And of course they were all in uh, bands in the Army. You know, that was very lucky for them. And so they, but they, they saw some, uh, also some of the war action too, some of mm -hmm. them did. And they told me about how, somehow it was and everything. 
but uh, they did a lot of studying being in the army bands and got to actually rub elbows with a lot of great musicians and they mm -hmm. learned a lot being there and they came back even more developed in the uh, areas of reading music, playing in the ensembles and writing music and all of that. Yeah. Were they overseas? Yes. You know, we're so used to almost instant communication nowadays. We almost forget about that. It must have been uh, tough on your, your parents to like wait for letters from, from the sons, you know. For some reason, we never had a thought of any of them getting hurt in the army. Really? We did have one brother that got hurt, but he never wasn't, I mean, he had to go in the hospital. Mm -hmm. and, but we never thought of any losing anybody. We never thought like that, you know. Our family was so, uh, my mother and father were such wonderful people. You know, the all I remember about my whole uh, childhood is just being very, in a very wonderful environment mm -hmm. of people that, that, that had a wonderful way of relating to each other. They taught me just a wonderful thing about attitude and all of that. Mm -hmm. And our attitude was that we knew they were going to come back. No matter what happened, we knew they were coming back, and they did. Was the church part of your um, upbringing? Oh, yeah. My mother used to make me go to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get away from Indianapolis soon enough, so I didn't have to do that anymore. Really? <laughs> they had me in church all day. Oh, all, all yeah, day. Yeah. <laughs> was, uh, was it a musical church? Was it part of the They always service? had some music, but it wasn't like some of the churches that you go, like in Philadelphia, there are some churches that got some choirs, mm -hmm. and some of them have, actually have musical bands and things there, you know. It was all singing in our, but in our house, there was music every day. I see. We were practicing and rehearsing every day, and all the people from the, the neighborhood were coming around, and the kids were coming, some of them were coming and learning, learning about being musicians, you know. My father was teaching everybody. He was a fantastic man. Oh. And did he have work besides music, too, during the day? He did. My father could do everything. Mm -hmm. He was a great painter. He painted beautiful pictures. He was a carpenter. Wow. He was a school teacher. He did everything. That's when he had that big family, you know. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was actually, he was very idealistic. You know, most people wouldn't try to raise a family. Man, he had about 10 kids, you know. <laughs> most people wouldn't try that. He yeah. didn't think that was anything. Mm -hmm. He really felt as though he could handle that with no problem because he could do so many things, and he did. He took care of us from the time that we were, till we were ready to leave home mm -hmm. with no problem. That's wonderful. Do you have photos from, <clears throat> from back then? I was just band? looking at my father and mother's photos before I came here oh. today, and a picture of our family band. Mm -hmm. One, when I was very young and I wasn't playing, I was dancing and singing in a band. Wow. And then one when I was older playing trombone. Well, that's, that's so interesting. Did you, did you have uh, people for the rhythm section, the whole? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had the rhythm section and everything right there wow. in, the, in the family. That's neat. I, I'm, I sometimes wonder if in those kind of situations you're your parents are thinking, well, let's see, we need a saxophone player, so... That, I think that's the way it was. <laughs> they finally needed a trombone. I was the last one born into the family. Oh, you were the youngest. So they said, we need a trombone player. Okay. You're going to play trombone, and your name will be Slide, whether you like it or not. Well, does that go back that far? Yeah. Your nickname? Yes. From the time wow. I started, I started actually playing trombone at 12. Mm -hmm. And when they gave me the trombone, they gave me the name. Right is that away. right? Yeah. Because you you have a is your name Loxley Wellington? Yes. Yeah, I got that out of the the, yeah. the, the um, Grove Dictionary. Yeah. Has, has nice things Not to many say people about know you. that. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting that that they pinned that on you right away. <laughs> <laughs> well, nicknames help too. Oh yeah. Ah, uh, that's great. And um, did you feel a need at a certain age to? Well, you mentioned getting out of Indianapolis, you know, time to spread your own wings a little bit? Well, see, when we played the uh, Apollo Theater, we had such a success that the booking agents wanted us to stay in New York. Mm -hmm. And we would have been, we would have had a, we would have had a good success in New York. But my sisters wanted to go back to Indianapolis. You know, the, now mm -hmm. ladies are. Yeah. 
And uh, so we didn't stay. And I, after I was in New York, the first time I remember when I was there, I went to Birdland to hear Bud Powell play. Mm -hmm. That was it for me. I had to come to New York after that. And that's all I talked about from that time until I got to New York, is I have to go to New York. And I just had this great feeling for New York. And all I could think about is how can I get to New York? So I finally left Indianapolis on my way to New York, $15 in my pocket. Wow. So I, I only got as far as Cincinnati, Ohio, but I played with Miles there. Played with Miles for a, a weekend. Mm -hmm. And then some friends found out that I was uh, in Cincinnati. They were in Houston, Texas. They sent for me to come from Cincinnati to Houston. So I took a bus ride from Cincinnati to Houston, Texas with horrible, long and painful and hot. And I stayed in Houston for a year playing because they had a great job there. They played one night a week in a club and it was a big success. And I played with that band until Buddy Johnson heard me and then he came and took me to New York City. So you took the long way <laughs> to New York. Um, did you have your first arrangement played with him, with Buddy Johnson? Well, actually, probably we the first professional arrangement. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Do you have the ability to sit at a desk like this and write? I used to. I mean... You need to be near a piano. And I used to write check without things. the piano. Yeah, I wrote a lot of the arrangements. Um, well, I said after I wrote for Buddy Johnson, and I wrote for Maynard for, uh, for uh, Lionel Hampton. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote for Maynard, and a lot of the arrangements I wrote for Maynard, I wrote without the piano. And those are recorded things. I was a young guy, you know. I had yeah. the energy that it takes to actually well, do that. Well, speaking of that, I have to play something for you <laughs> 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 because. Um, it's it's something I really think is <laughs> You remember this? You know I'd forgotten about this song. No kidding. Mark of Jazz. Mark of Jazz, yeah. You were <laughs> you were writing hot licks way back then too. Yeah, I was very well. Main, Maynard gave us a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, to arrange and to learn about arranging, and so we were inspired writing there in that in that band. So there were several guys that were writing a lot: Willie Maiden and Don Sebesky and a uh, couple of a couple of other guys that were in the band. And then they were playing arrangers by great arrangers from out of the band too. Mm. That was a hot group. Yeah, it was. Yeah. People really liked that band. Yeah. We certainly did. This this was um, fifty seven ish. Yes. Yeah. Did did the group like that being integrated run into any problems? Not really. Not okay. really. Glad to hear that. I think the only time that we had any problems like that was when we took a whole tour. It was Sonny Rollins and his uh, quartet, or his you know, with the trio, and it was Dave Brubeck with his group, Maynard Ferguson's band. And then with another, might have been the, f the four freshmen or somebody like that. And uh, we played really all through the South, you know, because it was such a big thing that they were in command everywhere for it. And we had some problems about finding places to eat and things like that. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, the whole thing wasn't like that, but once in a while it was. But when I was with Buddy Johnson's band, we couldn't eat in any of those places. We couldn't go in any hotels or anything like that, you know. In what parts of the country? In the and well, you know, when, as soon as you get down below uh, Washington, I guess, down to Virginia, then it was it was all it was all very difficult. Mm -hmm. But we were, you know, we were so much into the music, uh, we weren't thinking about that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that's the wonderful thing about a lot of the guys that came before us, that uh, had more of those problems than we did. The music was so important to them that they just rode right through all of that, you know. Mm -hmm. Music is like that. It's really wonderful that reading. It just takes, it's above everything. You know, it's above wars, it's above racism, it's above everything. Uh -huh. Because see, in the war, 
the guys that were having the jam sessions in the basement in Germany, the Germans, if they had been caught, they would have been killed. They were still having jam sessions, you know, mm -hmm. playing Charlie Parker or Duke Ellington in the basement with the windows covered with stuff, you know, so nobody would know. They took that kind of chance to play. That's how, that's how important the music was to them. Yeah. That's right, because that regime felt that, that jazz music was uh, oh, yeah, was they evil. Were. And they, there's a lot of music that they didn't uh, uh -huh. they didn't allow the people to listen to or play. Yeah. You know, but jazz was so important to the guy that they had to play it. And I, mean, I played with a lot of those guys when I lived in Europe. You know. Yeah, you spent uh, a number of years, almost nine years or so, mm -hmm. in Europe. Um, was that a planned decision, or did you go there and like it, it on a trip or something? It was spontaneous. It wasn't planned. Okay. <laughs> Impromptu. I was playing with uh, Woody Herman. And uh, at that time, when you joined a band, you didn't have any rehearsals or anything like that. You joined the band and you went right on the concert stage and played right there, and you had to sight read everything and all of that, you know. But we were always into that sight reading and all that was a part of what we did for fun, you know. So I was with Woody. We played England for two weeks. And uh, I had a very funny story with Woody because I was new in the band, so his, his conducting I wasn't familiar with, you know? Yeah. So I'm just trying to follow the conductor, because I feel when you give a downbeat, I'm playing. But I was playing alone when he gave it out. So every time he would give a downbeat, I would play, bam! And then the band would play after me, you know? So I'm wondering, what's going on? You know, I say, am I not, am I not seeing this right or what? So after the first week, he came to me and said, Slide, I'm paying you more money than anybody in the band. You're the only one that's playing wrong. <laughs> I said, I said, I know it, you know. I said, and I just can't figure out where your downbeat is. And I said, you know, is it here, is it here? Is it? And the guys told me later, they said, we don't play on his downbeat. He gets the downbeat, and then we play when we think we should play. So I said, I wait for them from up there. So, and after I played with him for two weeks, some people found out that I was in England. They said, while you're over here, come over on the continent of Europe and play some concerts over here. And I had never done this, and I didn't know the conditions. I didn't know what the conditions would be, but they offered me such wonderful conditions. First class transportation, first class hotel, great money for the group and the concerts and everything. So I went over and played a few concerts, and it was so unusual for me to be treated like that. Mm -hmm. I stayed for eight years. Wow. And playing mostly with European musicians? Sometimes with American musicians, yeah. sometimes with European yeah. musicians. I played with Dexter Gordon, Johnny Griffin, Benny Bailey, or oh, just a host of guys that were living, Kenny, Clenny Clark, mm -hmm. all the guys that were living over there, and also with the European musicians. We made radio shows, because see, in every city in Europe, there's a radio band that is subsidized by the government to play a certain amount of jazz every year. Isn't that something? That money, yeah. they can only use that money to, for jazz projects, you know, and they have that same uh, subsidy for classical music and for folk music. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of radio shows and television shows and cultural houses where we were playing concerts and festivals and all that. So it was really a fantastic experience. And you were treated pretty darn well then. Treated really. Uh huh. And I never had that kind of treatment before. It was uh -huh. a surprise to me. Um, what prompted you to come back? Well, after I stayed over there for a while, and I, I uh, was asked to come back to do this CD with Dexter Gordon, the Sophisticated Giant CD. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And we uh, and it was for us. It was a wonderful project, and I had worked with Dexter over there several times. He was just wonderful to work with. I had known of him before, but I didn't know him before, and I had no idea of what kind of person he was or anything. But working with him was like heaven. He treated everybody, musicians and audience alike, with all the love in the world. You know, mm -hmm. so I learned a lot working with him from, from that. And when he asked me to come back and do that, and asked me to stay. And I came back and things were starting to change in America then. Yeah. People were becoming interested in jazz again. 
Wasn't there a song on that record called Fried Bananas? Yes. Or something like that's that. That's next to the original. Yeah. Team. <laughs> Those are marvelous arrangements, and it's such a a nice sized ensemble, and yeah. there's vibes in there, right? Yeah. It's just yeah. colors are great on it. It's, it's, I, I could have done a much better job of the arranging, you know. It, I, you think off, so? Yeah, I was shooting that stuff off and then not really getting it, you know. But, huh. <laughs> but I was shooting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're probably your own worst critic when it comes to something like that. Well, you always, you know, because, you know, when you have a chance to do something like that, you really want to do something that has some real meaning and some real value. Mm -hmm. Because to get all of those guys together, because some of them were still living in Europe and they were coming from all over the place. and. They're wonderful attitudes. They work together very professional and very loving, you know. Yeah. And you would get not a lot of studio time, right, to pull no, something like never, that off? No, you never get much studio time. In fact, one of the CDs that we've done recently, we produced it ourselves, it's the first time that we've had enough time in the studio mm -hmm. to really do it the way that we should. Yeah. Because then it was always, you were running through those things and you know, they were, they were trying to be as uh, considerate as possible, but it could only go on so long, and they say, listen, you've got to move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, um, you had mentioned coming back and that the country seemed to be taking a little more interest in jazz music. That's um, interesting that you say that, because this was late 70s, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, um, was it the start of the educational interest in the music? Yes, it was. Yeah. That was one of the things that opened up to the jazz musicians. We were off, I've been offered many jobs in universities, mm -hmm. but I never went to high school, so mm. I couldn't take them. You know, I, I told her, I'd have to tell the truth and say that I'm not really, I don't have the credentials for this. You know, I had the experience for it and things like that, but I don't have the credentials and I'm not going to lie about the thing like that, you know, so, um, but I would always, when I was offered a job like that, I would recommend somebody that did have the credentials, that also had the ability. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people who have the credentials, though, who don't have the experience, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, you have the real life, hands-on experience, and th that's worth a great deal. Experience is very important, of course, and the thing that's really most important of all is to be true to yourself, mm -hmm. to tell the truth to yourself and to everyone else. That's very important because that's what improvisation actually is about. It's about saying what the truth is about your feelings mm -hmm. and about your experience and about what it is that you can do and what you can't do. That's what makes the, the thing that imp improvisation does for me. It makes me realize that. I don't have to feel bad about the thing that I can't do, but I have to admit it. Because then it's a, an advantage to me. Mm -hmm. But I try to make myself believe that I can do things that I can't do, it's a dumb being a disadvantage to myself. And improvisation is like that. It makes you admit the truth about yourself. The good and the bad. There's plenty of bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great thought. I really like the way you put that. Uh, I, I can envision getting in a position where you are expected to play in a certain style and it just wouldn't be you. Yeah. And trying to do it and it wouldn't last too long, I would guess. I'm not good at playing in different styles. Mm -hmm. Unless it's something that I just feel to do because of the situation I'm in, I'm not good at being able to reproduce what other guys have done. Oh. If you were to describe the style you like to play in or your own trombone style, is it possible to put it into words? Yes, very easily because, see the trombone, that instrument actually was, we, we, we were kind of gave a false impression in many cases because you think about the circus you think about, you know, you hear the trombone bar up and all of that, you know. But the trombone actually was invented to play melodies. That's what it was invented for, and that's where it's the most beautiful, it's when it's playing melodies. Mm -hmm. So that's the strong point that I work on in my own development, is the, the ability to play melodies and to make 
lines that I play or other improvisations sound melodious. Because there's one thing that I found out about people, they can relate to a melody. Mm -hmm. And if especially one that they've already heard, but even if they haven't heard it and it's beautiful, they can relate to it. And once you play one song that they know, everything you play after that, they'll try their best to understand it. You know? <laughs> so that's my style, is trying to be melodious mm -hmm. and try to develop, I work on my sound. I want to have the most beautiful sound that I can. So when somebody hears it, even before they think about what I'm playing, they say, that sounds good. That feels good. That sounds good. Great. Good thoughts again. <laughs> You have like these things you're saying that ought to be put in stone somewhere, I think. Thank you. There. Thank you. Um, what to you makes a good melody? Well, like anything else, the construction of a melody, the natural, the way that it resolves naturally from one note to the other. And uh, you, of course, you know you have a lot of have a lot of practice in that, and all the great people that came before you that wrote melodies. There's so many great melodies that started. I don't know how long ago, thousand years ago even maybe, but uh, to have a melody that a person can listen to. I thought about that recently. A melody that a person can listen to it they never heard before, but they still can appreciate it and enjoy it. Mm. The beauty of it. Of course, you can always enjoy a melody that you know, if it's something that you like. But to be able to play a melody or to write a melody or compose a melody that people can listen to and say, yeah, I like that, although I haven't heard it before. I think that's one of the things that the standards that I try to look for in playing or writing a melody. Mm -hmm. If if I uh, was to arrange for a commission for you and leave it totally wide open. So maybe describe the instrumentation or something, but at any rate, just say, we want a slide Hampton composition, but we want a new thing. Where do you start with something like that? As a, I've, always, I've been asked the question many times, how do you start to approach either a composition or an arrangement? You had to start actually just by getting an idea of what it is that whoever you're going to do it for wants and then to let it develop in a natural way in the feeling for it and actually the idea of it in your mind to let it develop in a natural way. So if you say you want a composition and you have a certain instrumentation, that instrumentation alone can inspire you a place to start. At least once you get a place to start, then the rest of it is natural development after that. Mm -hmm. I've had situations where I've been uh, commissioned to do things for the Joe Henderson Big Band CD, and when they gave me the composition, the first thing I try to do is try to find a melody. If you find a good melody, see, because a good melody stands by itself. That's the arrangement, that's the composition, that's everything, the theory and everything. If you find a good melody, then the rest of the things are going to fall in place. See? So if you're going to arrange something, for instance, you find a song that inspires you to arrange. And actually, I feel like, except for people that write just for, to make a living, the only way that a person should approach an arrangement is by inspiration so that whatever they're inspired to do will lead some kind of a long-lasting musical standard that inspires the next person to write something that's valuable. You see? So I, start with, I would start probably with finding a melody. And from that melody I would find, I would be, find the introduction later, the interludes, the way that's going to resolve into other melodies, the way that it's finally going to develop. Mm -hmm. you see? Does the individual you're writing for shape the way you write also? Well, it can, you know, and if you have people that you, that you really uh, are, are familiar with and love the way they play, but you still have to write, I like to write something that anybody can play it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. 
the enjoyment of the musician is one of the very first things to me, that they enjoy playing it. Because I know that if they enjoy playing it, they're going to get a certain feeling, of course, to the people that are listening to it. That inspiration is going to make everything, because see, music is not, when you write music down, that's not music. Music is what somebody interprets from that, mm -hmm. interprets from that thing that you write down. And that's when the music starts. It's when the musicians get it and decide what they're going to do with it and start to develop it. See, whenever you heard some of the recordings and things that we liked of the big bands, Glenn Miller, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, they had played that music for a long time before they recorded it. See, they didn't yeah. go in the studio like we do now. Yeah, just and they give you a whole bunch of new music. You go in there and learn it and record it. I mean, it's still new to you. There's so much that you could do if you really get to know it. That's true. Those songs that they recorded back then had been tweaked and, you know, <laughs> just gotten to that wonderful point where they were ready to record. Wow. Huh. Do you, uh, this is kind of a technical question, do you write a transposed score when you work? I'm transposed score. Yeah. I could easily write a concert score. But you know what I think about? I think about the poor guy that has to transpose it, you know. <laughs> right, it all in C, nice you. then yeah. let him do all that transposition, yeah. you know. I think, man, I said, well, that must be a job. <laughs> you know, so I always, I always did develop the, the transpose score approach. And I also write with, you know, I write with a pen or pencil. I don't, I don't use computers or anything okay. like that. I enjoy writing the traditional way. Yeah. Well, it also helps, I guess, <clears throat> if you're writing a transpose score, is you actually know what you're asking these people to pull off from a saxophone standpoint and that whole thing, you know. That's true, the range, because when you right. write a concert score, you still have to keep in mind the range right. of the instruments and everything. Right. If you look at a piece or you're writing and you look down beat one of a particular measure of what you've written, how much of that can you hear in your head? Well, what I do, I'm writing a score right now, and it's for two flutes, clarinet, bass clarinet, uh, nine violins, three violas, two cellos, bass, three trombones, three trumpets, piano, bass, drums, guitar, percussions. And what I do is uh, I think you know, everything starts off usually to me, I mean, in life. Things usually don't hit you right over the head. They usually start off as something, maybe a, a smaller approach to a conversation or whatever, rather than just coming in and really throwing a lot of words at you. You know, so I start off with the thing being as not too, I don't like to start off with everything at once. Mm -hmm. I like for it to start small and develop. Because I think it does a lot of good for the human ear and for the people that are going to listen when they have a chance to, you give them a chance to get used to it before you throw the whole thing at them, you mm -hmm. know. Some people like to throw the whole thing right in the beginning, you know. When I'm playing this the same way, I like to start my concerts not too fast, not too loud, not too big. Just give the people a chance to let their ears get used to the music. Mm -hmm. And then as they do, then you can give them some more uh, dissonant things, some more volume and stuff like that, in and out of the thing. So I, I, like to, I like to let a thing develop from a small beginning, in and out of using more of the instruments, not using them all through the whole thing changing like that. Yeah. Is there ever a temptation to write give somebody something to play because they haven't had anything to play in a while? In the, in the ensemble? Yeah. Well, it's not really a problem because actually when you're uh, looking at a score, you always are inspired to use probably more often than not mm -hmm. things that don't have to be there. <coughs> the whole idea I find the simplicity is where you get the real, 
you get the most the mo most value out of the thing when you can write simple. Mm -hmm. That means that when you do write complicated or write the whole ensemble, it has more of a purpose. But you can always use, especially if you know you have good musicians, that's the thing that affects it, the level of musicianship that you're dealing with. You can write one person playing when it's a really good musician, and it will have a good effect. Mm -hmm. But if it's not a musician that doesn't have very much experience and you write them by themselves, it can feel uncertain. Yeah. You see? But you know, all the instruments can always be used in so many ways to make the different colors, the different effects, and to make as much variety as possible. That's very important. Mm. You've played um, an awful big role in Dizzy Gillespie's career. Mm, well, I think little, you little must little be, well, I think he had some a good uh, positive effect on what he was able to do. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, I look at that because I, I joined Dizzy's band <clears throat> in either the late 50s or the early 60s. And the band that I joined was the band with Lee Morgan, Benny Golson, uh, Wenton Kelly, Melba Liston was the musical director, and they were playing so much music, man. They just, my head was, <laughs> had my head spinning. I never wrote anything for the band. Mm -hmm. Because the music that they were playing, the arrangers were so good that I just didn't feel like I wanted to try to write something coming up to that level of mm -hmm. arranging that they were doing. So, actually, I was just there learning. I wasn't able to contribute much of anything. Mm -hmm. They had all the great soloists there. They had the great arrangers there and everything. Dizzy was even writing himself, and Dizzy was playing fantastic itself. His chops were strong, you know. They were playing all these great arrangers, so. I didn't contribute that much to him until later when I joined the United Nations band. Yeah. I started doing some writing for that. But it was always still very intimidating to be writing for him because he was such a great arranger himself. Standards were very high. Yeah. Were there certain things that he liked to hear? Was that <coughs> possible to answer that? I mean, certain tempos, feels. I know he's loved Latin grooves. Well, he liked Latin things, but he didn't. He didn't mind not it not being Latin. The thing that he looked for was the sincerity of the essence mm -hmm. of the the arrangement or composition. They were very. All of their arrangements had a real strong expressive aspect. That was the thing that Dizzy's band introduced into music that made a lot of guys feel like they wanted to avoid facing the reality of what they were doing because they weren't writing things just to write a good arrangement. Those arrangements had a definite purpose and they were really very inspired by that whole concept of music that those guys were coming from, <laughs> which was the concept of music that dealt with people that had to be doing a lot of work on what they were doing a lot of studying and a lot of practice, virtuosity in the music in general, that's what Dizzy's Man was about. So they wrote things that you had to work on. If you weren't a virtuoso, you had still had to do a lot of practice to try to play whatever it was that they wrote. Mm -hmm. So the music was based on that kind of thing. You know, it's very sincere music, and a music that had a lot of feeling, a lot of expression, and was very inspiring to all the music world in general. You know. So that's, that's where he was coming from. He was a pretty spiritual person. Yeah, he was in a lot of different spiritual things, yeah. though, you know. <laughs> he had different spirits. I see. <laughs> yeah. He ended up in a, uh, uh, what was that, the... Uh, Baha'i? Baha'i. Yeah. yeah. He was in the, yeah, the, the spiritual thing that come from the East and things like that, you know. But I think that he was more, Dizzy was just more of a, he was a great spirit himself, you mm -hmm. know. More so than what he could really get out of a religion. I guess he looked in that for some reason, but, but he had a great spirit himself, you know. You go back and see this guy that came from a place in the South where he 
he uh, uh, was living in a situation where racism and all of that was really rampant, you know. And this guy just went through all of that like it was nothing. And Dizzy, see, Dizzy would, in school, Dizzy would skip a grade whenever he wanted to. He was that smart. So his brother that was next older than him, he skipped until he got into the class with him, and then he finished school with him. No kidding. He's a brilliant guy, you know. Mm -hmm. Kind of guy that could hear hear language and things and just on his own figure out exactly how the theory of a language should be. He was like that, you know. Wow. But you hear from what he played, his mind was was working incredibly fast. Mm -hmm and very on a very sophisticated level and at the same time he could come right down to earth and be as down to earth as you more down to earth than you can stand actually <laughs> <laughs> like like how well he did he could be he could talk with a person from any level of the society and speak an english that was just incredible and then he come right down and speak with the guy that had no education at all mm -hmm. and feel completely comfortable with them you yeah. know it's fantastic, you know. I, I never was able to do that, you know. Quite a sense of humor, too. A wonderful sense of humor. Yeah. You know, could have been a comedian if he wanted to, mm -hmm. you know. But he always brought a lot of humor and a wonderful feeling to the people that work with him. And he treated the people with a lot of love. The musicians with a lot of love. He was one of the best band leaders around. Hmm. Has there been a time... Um, from an economic standpoint, that's been toughest in your career, a period of years? Not really. I find that all the things about even economics and all of that is a problem for me, problem that I made myself. Hmm. It wasn't what was happening in society or in, you know, in general. It was, whenever I had a problem with those things, I made that problem myself. And when we were coming up, we were so interested in learning we never thought about money. You know, we were practicing all day, man. It would, people were sick of us, you know. They said, you guys are crazy. You're never going to do anything till you're spending all this time playing all this funny music, you know. And oh, we loved it so much, we never were offended. We never, you know, we never thought about, are we going to make money or we're not going to make money? We never thought about that. Oh, we thought about, man, how can we learn to play a C7 how many different ways can we play a C7? That's what we were doing every day from the morning to night. This is the, the group in Indianapolis with... Were you in the same school, Freddie Hubbard and, and those guys? My brothers and sisters were. Okay. Yeah, they were all in uh, but, Attic High School. Okay. But it was just a congregation of people that had that same passion yeah, there were a lot of musicians there that were all, you know, the classical musicians and the jazz musicians were studying together. Mm -hmm. They were actually uh, trading uh, experience and knowledge with each other, and, and we'd get together and play. We'd get together and read music just for the, the fun of it, mm -hmm. and we'd get together and try to write an arrangement and have somebody to play it. it was horrible, you know, but we were so glad to have the opportunity to try. That's, that was the thing that we thought about. Yeah to get to hear those things and experiment and find out what works and what doesn't. It was wonderful. It was wonderful just to think that it might sound like something. And often it didn't, you know. But we enjoyed the part before we heard that, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I didn't ask you about the Black Artist Orchestra, the Manhattan Plaza. Composer's Orchestra. Oh yeah, that, yeah. that orchestra. I think Jimmy uh, Owens had a great deal to do with that yeah. orchestra. And uh, I, I got to write quite a few things for them. It was a wonderful experience because it was free to do whatever I wanted to. Usually mm -hmm. some kind of direction in the program, but with a chance to have the freedom as far as the thing that I wanted to try, the thing that I wanted to experiment with and all of that. It was a wonderful opportunity for me, so I had a chance to do a lot of good things there. To learn a lot was one of the main things. Mm -hmm. And the guys were very uh, willing to try all kind of things. What did you think of the, I guess they would have called it the avant-garde <coughs> period, um, free jazz and so forth that Ornette was doing and some of Coltrane's later work? 
Well, we did a lot of that in Europe already before I came back, you know. Mm -hmm. In fact, see, in Europe they had some subsidy for, for uh, projects that were based on free music. That means that you were usually doing things that were somewhat unusual to the way that you usually approach composing or, or writing music. And uh, I felt it was a, a thing that had a good had a good had a good uh, re effect on in general on our musical growth because it was a chance for us to experience something different in music, and it was a chance to do something that ordinarily would give what well, would give us a chance to be completely free okay what happens when you're completely free and see what happens the only thing that i didn't agree with about it is when you have a musical uh concept that's new i think you should always still have a relationship to the music that comes before so that you can see where that relates to the music don't all i don't you shouldn't all jump jump off and do something that you can't tell it had anything to do with all the stuff that came before because all the music that came before is a reason that something should happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people made it happen because they didn't want to have a contact with the thing that happened before. And things don't happen like that. Things develop from one stage and they don't all of a sudden, the, the, the glacier didn't all of a sudden jump from North America and then jump to South America, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a mess if it had. <laughs> So music is the same way. You can't disconnect it. I see. You can do. You can go. You can be as advanced as you want, but don't disconnect it. Still keep the the the, the development process in a natural process, mm -hmm. from the traditional thing. Come all the way up and go as far as you want to, but somehow be able to go back and see how that line connects, because that's the way nature is. And no matter, how, no matter how much we want to do a thing, we still always have to go by the rules of nature. You know? Yeah. That's very interesting again. Um, and you've also done some work in the, I guess you would call it the popular music field with some Motown artists and that kind of thing. Yeah. How'd that come about? Well, I was, uh, that was during the time when the trombone actually was becoming quite unpopular in the States. Mm -hmm. That was in the 60s after I had played with Diddy Man and Art Blakey. And uh, you weren't hearing much about trombone on any recordings or anything like that. And, but this, this guy, uh, Barry Gordy, and, and some other people that knew about me because I had worked with Lloyd Price Band as a musical director. And so they wanted me to come out there because they actually wanted to start some kind of a jazz label. I don't think they said they wanted to start a jazz label. I don't think they know what they really meant when uh -huh. they said They didn't mean the same thing that we might have meant. Uh -huh. But when I went out there and I, I uh, started working as a conductor, I was conducting shows and conducting Stevie Wonder and, and the Four Tops and all of that stuff and some of the big shows and things. And I went into some of the studios, the studio work that they were doing. I went to the studios and they had a way of writing that was really unique. I really, it wasn't, you couldn't just be a good writer and go out there and, and, and take part in that, you know? This, there was something special they had. And when I went in and listened to it, I heard it say, yeah, this is something different with these guys. This is something that they really feel. Mm -hmm. that's, where it, that's where it developed. So it wasn't, I, was able to, I wasn't able to really contribute a lot. I did some arranging in special situations, but I wasn't able to get into that stuff that they were writing behind the Supremes and all of that. Yeah. that the, those guys did that better than anybody. Who were those guys? Well, it was, they called them the, well, one of the, the group that did all the recording was called the Funk Brothers. Uh -huh. That was the rhythm section. They had a lot to do with because they would get a very simple lead sheet and they would develop the music that we heard out of that lead sheet. But then with some other guys that were writing that were, that, they had several writers that were doing the arrangements. And uh, those guys, it was, you know, about four or five guys, and they had a special way of writing that was, was really wonderful for that music, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you listen to, uh, like, My Girl, the way that tune develops, and eventually the string parts fit in, and they, they mesh with what has already been going on, which just continues throughout the song, it's really... As you said, pretty special. There's some thought that went into it, yeah. you know, and it's a, it was a feeling. Mm -hmm. It wasn't only a, a, a system, it was a feeling because 
I listened to it and I was trying to see what is this that they're doing, you know, but I couldn't really, I couldn't really catch it. I guess I didn't really find it as interesting as I might have found when I listened to Bebop, I had to find out what was going on. So I listened for hours and and listened to all the CDs and, and went over stuff and everything. But there I was listening to see if I could understand that concept. I didn't, but I did enjoy what they did though. Mm -hmm. Who were the favorite people that you might have backed up back then or conducted for? Well, the one group that I worked with, in fact, was uh, the Four Tops. I conducted more for them. And because the Four Tops actually had some wonderful stories with those guys, because they were a group of guys that were together making music because they loved to make music together, and they were beautiful people together, too. Mm -hmm. And they told me some wonderful stories, and, and I heard recently that they were, after they moved to California, Billy Eckstein wanted to record with a group like the, the Four Freshmen. But he couldn't get them, but the Four Tops were there. So they, he said, can you guys sing like the Four Freshmen? They said, sure we can. And he said, they went in for an hour or so and worked on some stuff and came back out and said, okay, this is it. And they sang some stuff like the Four Freshmen. And then they made a whole CD together with those guys singing behind him, you mm -hmm. know. They were like that. They were guys that really loved to work together. They had had a great experience together, good and bad. And I, I conducted for them and did some writing for them. And it was, it was I really liked those guys. Who was the lead singer? Uh, Otis Scrubs. Otis, or was that? I can't remember. Um, Leroy S Scrubs. Leroy Scrubs. So I think it was that. Scrubs or Stubbs? Stubbs. Leroy Stubbs, Stubbs or yeah. Scrubs, yeah. 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 Very identifiable sound. Yeah. Yeah, they were a great group. They they brought a lot of good feeling to wherever they worked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you ever had to work a non-music job? I tried in your career. You tried. Oh no, you mean since I was became since I became a musician? Yeah. No, no. After I became a musician, I didn't have to go outside mm -hmm. to work anything. I, but before, mm -hmm. before I became a professional musician, I I had a job as a waiter. Mm -hmm. But I dropped my first tray. Get out. Your first tray. <laughs> the first tray. <laughs> so the guy said, don't worry about that. Everybody dropped their first tray. You know? <laughs> I said, well, that was my last tray, too. <laughs> I think it was prophetic. <laughs> the first tray. It was good for the music business that you dropped your first tray. I want to Filled say. Filled with dishes, you know. Oh. In this big hotel luxury restaurant. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> People were like yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> um, more recently, you took on a big. It would seem like a challenge to me with uh, doing a Love Supreme. Oh yeah. With the, was it the Carnegie Hall? Carnegie Hall band. band. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't do a very good job on it. Oh, you said that. You're saying that again. Great, no. great songs. Yeah. Did, have you listened to that CD? Yeah. By Train? Mm hmm It's a great oh, CD. Oh, Lord, I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> it's to a like, great CD. I, yeah. And I, now I go back and say, oh, well, my arrangement definitely didn't, didn't make it, you know. Yeah. Because the music they played was so high on there. Well, I would agree that it would be very hard to capture that intensity. I don't care how many guys you have. Yeah. Sometimes all those people can't match what happened with those four individuals. I was missing the point. I missed it. I yeah. missed it. And I, you know, what does I need to do with Love Supreme? I need to listen to that album for a year. Hmm. Because there's so much music there that you can't just get all of that really fast and know what's going on there. I had to do it too fast. Oh. And I, when I was listening to the CD, I was thinking, man, this is a lot of music in here. And every time you listen to another track, there's a lot of music in there. And then there's a lot of music all the way through the whole thing, <laughs> you know. So I, my arrangement wasn't, it wasn't, it was a good idea, but it didn't, didn't make it. Hmm. What, per <laughs> what percentage of... Uh your own work do you feel like that about? Well, most times what was happening was I was, I was going too fast. 
having to finish too fast. Deadlines, right? You're you're given a deadline. Yeah. Well, I, no. One time when I was when, before I was working with deadlines, and deadlines are funny things. When you have a deadline, you have to find out how you can arrive at that deadline with the most quality in what you're doing. And, and uh, a lot of times, trying to get there fast is the worst way to go there, <laughs> you know. I found out recently, when you, when you have something that you don't have much time to do, make sure that you're rested first. So your mind will work on the highest level that it can. And then even if you can't spend a lot of time in it, the time that you spend, you'll be producing the best music that you can find. But if you work tired, it's going to take the quality of the music mm. down. So that's what I did it many times when I was making deadlines. So now what I do is I take all the time I need and just until I really enjoy what it is that I'm writing. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't put it down. So if you got a call to do some writing and, you know, we need this next Thursday, would you most likely turn that down? Most times I would turn it down. Yeah. I would recommend somebody that I know does those deadline things very well. <laughs> <laughs> Who are your uh, people that were your contemporaries? Uh, that you enjoyed as far as arrangers? Well, you know, of course, one of my, I guess one of my first inspirations was, uh, there were so many guys, <laughs> but Billy Strayhorn was one of my first inspira inspirations. And a lot of people, when they listen to Duke, they don't know how much of that work was done by Billy as far as the orchestrations are concerned. Duke was the inspiration, but Billy was the guy that really was, uh, you know, the orchestrator. And uh, I really like Billy, and I, I, I love Billy. And I love a lot of the guys that wrote for Dizzy. I love Gil Evans, mm -hmm. you know. I think that Gil was one of the most complete of all the guys. Because I was listening recently to some of his older arrangements. They did, I was, in, I was in Holland, and they played the older things. Robin's Nest. Anthropology and all of that. And you could get us an idea of where he was going. But when he finally got together with Miles, it was all there. Mm -hmm. And those things that they did are just really, that's some of the greatest arranging that I could ever, that I've ever heard. There are other great arrangers, good arrangers, but that was a complete, that was not just an arrangement, that was uh, orchestration, composition arrangement, everything together. Yeah. You know. Orchestration is a whole skill in itself, don't you think? Yeah. You know. I learned that from Peter and the Wolf. Uh-huh. The orchestration is bad. The melodies are, are humorous, you know, but the orchestration is bad, man. <laughs> I agree, and uh, like, um, um, What's the Tchaikovsky they always play at Christmas time? Yeah. Uh, well, that's a, I, yeah. It's, it's that's with the dance of the, the sugar plum fur, the nutcracker. That's bad. Orchestration is incredible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you can learn, you know, you can learn from Just from anybody. that, man. All you have to do is look at those scores. You can learn everything about orchestration, because that yeah. guy was really rough, man. <laughs> <laughs> what was going on in his mind, I'm yeah, thinking, yeah. yeah. Boy, what he could have done with the Ellington band. Oh, right? boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting, too, because those, I don't think that guys like Tchaikovsky were actually writing for individuals either. Mm -mm. So they didn't have that extra, like Ellington had such individuals, he could. Yeah, he knew what they yeah, could do, but those right. guys, they wrote for inferior musicians, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, the guy that were playing in those ensembles might have been a butcher, or you know, he got yeah. butchering stuff before he played, you know. <laughs> so they were very, they were, they were thinking, you know, they were thinking about the, the, they were able to even think past the fact that they didn't have all, didn't have all the guys to play their music then like the guys do mm -hmm. classical music now, you know. Yeah, they wrote it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um. 
What's your feeling about the jazz today? Well, some, I've been asked that question recently, and see, the wonderful thing about jazz is where jazz comes in from, where it comes from and why is the thing that answers when people think, is jazz going to live, is it going to die? Jazz is one of the only art forms where people have the freedom of expression. And, and don't, you don't have to say anything bad about anybody to do what you feel. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything that uh, actually rubs anybody the wrong way to do what you feel. There's no language that you know where you're saying anything. And offend. You don't offend anybody. You know, you don't make anybody think that personally you're attacking them. It's the only thing that you can do that with. You can express your exact feelings and somehow people from everywhere have experienced those same things that you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Jazz is one of the only things like that. So jazz is a music that comes from a very natural part of the human race in general. The thing that's different about it is that it doesn't allow any person or group to control it. That's one of the most dangerous things about it. It makes people free. And it's in all the, you know, all the big, uh, countries and uh, that are, are like the uh, countries that have strong political parties and all of that, that's frightening to them. But the one thing they don't want is for a person to have their own opinion about things. Mm -hmm. Jazz gives you a chance to have your own opinion. And that's one of the really fantastic things about it even more than the music is that it gives you a chance to express how you feel and and and, feel, and also say, yeah, well, he had the right to say what he feels too. Mm -hmm. He had the right to play the way that he plays, just as much as I do. And that's what makes it wonderful that all these different rights give you all these different possibilities and inspirations and all that. You know, jazz will always exist. Because people have to, unless they finally just put everybody in the thing and just make them do whatever they want them to do forever, there will all be, even then, there'll be somebody slipping around trying to play a blues chorus, you know? <laughs> Very interesting. What's coming up in the near future for you? Next week, Paris, London. And then we're going to fly over. I'm flying over to Paris because <clears throat> I have to do business in Paris. And I'm going to London because we're coming back on the QE2. And we're playing for the whole way back. Wow. With, uh, with the Dizzy Gillespie sex set. Mm. And who is in that group now? This time will be Terrell Stadford, uh, Antonio Hart, I think Rini Rossness. Uh, John Lee and Dennis McCrell and they're giving us the best cabins on the boat. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I like Antonio Hardy. He reminds me of Cannonball some who was my absolute He's hero. He's a talented guy. I think yeah. this guy has so much talent, man. You got to <laughs> find some way. <laughs> yeah. hold, hold him. <laughs> He's brilliant, man. You know. He knows so much. He loves music so much that he just, you know, he doesn't think it, he probably hard for him to relate to too much outside of music. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he's been, it's been wonderful working with him because he's, he's a very serious, whatever he plays, he's very serious about it. Mm -hmm. He can play a lot of different styles, you know. But I was, see, when I was in Berlin, I worked with Leo Wright. Leo Wright and Carmel Jones, we were in uh, the, uh, the, one of the radio bands together. Leo could play every style of music that there is and play them all with conviction. It was one of the most fantastic things I ever saw. He could play country western, he could play the blues, he could play old style, he could play traditional, he could play straight ahead, he could play like train. It's unbelievable. And the guys were actually mad at him because he, the guy could play so many styles, they hired him for everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, He could read everything yeah. at sight, you know. <laughs> Tony's got a lot of that in him, man. Uh -huh. 
Did you ever have occasion to to work much with the Adderley brothers? Uh, not much, but I, you know, I have worked with them. Yeah. And one of my experiences with, uh, well, my, I guess one of my main ways to not to work with, but I worked on the same concert with Miles when Cannonball was there in Train, oh. and also when JJ and Nat Adderley were together in the quintet. All right. I was with Maynard, and they were on. They were opening the concert with their band. And that was, really, yeah, that was, I, but I, I've, I've also recorded with Nat. You know, I did a very bad CD with Nat, too. I, I played very badly on it. It was very nice of him to give me the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. But I played some tuba on that CD, and... What was the name of that? Uh, I don't know, I wanted to forget it. Oh, you know? okay. <laughs> <laughs> I probably have it, but I... He did some wonderful arrangements and things, though. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your calendar and your, your plate remains full. I worked so much in the last few months. I was working so much that I, I couldn't get to practice or anything. Now I'm able to practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm practicing and writing because I have these things coming up where I have to do all my own music and all of that for the radio and things like that. Yeah. So I'm getting a chance right now. I'm every, all day long. I'm practicing and writing, and it's it's just a wonderful feeling. Is it hard to keep a big band fairly consistent from a personnel standpoint? Yeah, almost impossible. Yeah. When you have good musicians, they're always doing a lot of other things. So you just can you can never keep a band with all the same guys anymore. There was a time when you could do that. But now, not, not now. All good musicians have a lot of projects of their own that they're doing. So you, you know, you get them once in a while, but not very often. It it must be hard to just mount one concert, you know, it to get be, a rehearsal yeah. in and yeah, scheduling. Get, oh it's a job. Well, when we did the trombone album, you know, the trombone CD, we, you know, we did that one thing, but we we we, we could never have that same mm -hmm. group again. But we had good guys after that too, the guys yeah. that weren't on the CD. And when we did the trombone thing at the uh, recently at the Blue Note, with Bobby Burgess and Bill Watrous, you know, those guys and, and Benny Powell, they love to work together, you know. So they'll just about do anything they can to get to work in that group because they love being there so much. But in general, when you got a group like that, it's hard to get that group together more than once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Always will be some change in there, you know. Have you had uh, good or bad luck dealing with record companies over the years? Well, in a way, you know, you can look at it two ways. It was good that you got to record, and you know, as far as the, the popularity is concerned, but record companies have a very strange business ethic. Very strange. <laughs> <laughs> and it isn't good, for, not for the artist. Yeah. You know, and I haven't understood yet what they're, what they're, what it is that they're trying to achieve. It looks like they're mainly building up a catalog and then selling it. That seems to be what they, they never seem to try to keep the record company building in a way that it's going to last. Because for some reason, they don't really believe in paying royalties, see. But now in Europe, they pay royalties. See, they got some organizations over there like Sesame, uh, in Germany, Gamer. You have to pay royalties over there. <laughs> if somebody whistles your music on the street, they got to pay. <laughs> you know, if a band plays your song, a marching band, they have to pay. No kidding. And in the clubs, if you play and you don't put all the music down, they say, well, we were there on Thursday night, and you played Thelonious Monk, and you don't have it on here. These are representatives of those organizations. Yeah. Wow. It's wonderful, man. Uh-huh. Especially <laughs> for the writers. Yeah. They have a great respect for composers, because they had all those great composers in the classical music over I there, see. so that developed from that time. Yeah. Do you think jazz over there has a little bit of the... Um, I don't know if exotic is the right word, but the fact that it came from somewhere else gives it a little more juice. 
Yeah, whether they whether they look up whether they appreciate it more because of that. No, their appreciation for jazz is just like their appreciation for all art forms. Mm. They live for art, man. <laughs> you know, this is so important to them to go to a concert. You know, they have passed up a meal to go to a concert. They've been developed that over many years. That whole appreciation for for art. They they treat artists over there. They wanted they would have they would have given Charlie Parker a city over there. You know, <laughs> they tried to get him to stay. They would have given him whatever he wanted. You know, so it's it's appreciation for art that they have. They go five hundred miles to hear a concert. Well, maybe because most of those countries are a lot older than the United States. They're very old. You know, yeah, they, they're they're definitely old. <laughs> it's taken all that time, so. <laughs> We'll look to the future. Over the here. States is doing pretty good, though. The United States is doing pretty good with their appreciation of art now, mm -hmm. too. I was watching television the other night, and they had on the Mostly Mozart <coughs> series at Lincoln Center. And, you know, and the, pe the guy was playing piano, he was playing really great, too. Mm -hmm. And the people in the audience were, you know, they were smiling, and they were applauding after each uh, part. Was this on last night? Yeah, I saw it too. They were pointing yeah. after each part yeah. of the of the, said, the, wow, the composition. Really they something. don't usually do that, you know. Right. They're supposed to wait till they the end. They couldn't wait they couldn't till the wait. end. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, right. It was like yeah. they're in a jazz club. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been most most fascinating for me. I enjoyed and, it, and very I really much. enjoyed. Uh, you have a great deal to say and a great way of saying it, and I. Oh, really thank you very it. much. I've, yeah. I've yeah. enjoyed it very much. Good. And my, yeah. my pleasure. And uh, good luck on that big boat coming back. That should be a lot of fun. Yeah, that will be. Yeah. We're in the, almost in the penthouse. All right. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just going to practice up there, okay. man. <laughs> People are going. Oh. Yeah, they're going. It's going it's you get right out on the terrace there and do that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, I'll be listening for your next group and CD okay. and so forth. Enjoyed it. Right.